has anyone ever accused you of being a control freak? Think about that. Have you ever been accused of that? If you are married, then you most certainly know if your spouse is a control freak. I looked up the definition of a control freak, and it said a person having a strong need for control over people or situations. So some of you know that you're a control freak, and you say, yep, it's the title I wear with honor. I like to control things. Others of you are in denial about being a control freak. You say, I am not a control freak. I just like for things to be done a certain way, and my way is the right way. So what's wrong with that? You know, there are times in life when we encounter situations that are outside of our control, and most of us hate that feeling when we feel like things are out of control in life. If you have kids, if you think back to the time when you took that first child home from the hospital, you put your baby in the car seat, and the car seat seems so big, and your baby seems so small, so you propped your baby's head up with towels, and then you're driving this precious small child through all the dangerous traffic on the freeway, and you're going 30 miles per hour with your flashers on because you want all those other cars to slow down because you have precious cargo in there. And then you take your baby into your house and you realize that people are trusting you with this little baby. If there's a problem in the night, you can't just press a button and have the nurse come to your room. This can be a scary time when you feel out of control. And then another time when you feel out of control involves the same child in your car, but now your child has turned 16 and you're handing the car keys to your child as you sit in the passenger seat. If you want to know what it feels like to be out of control, then ride with a teenager who is learning to drive. If you want to learn how to pray, that's a good way to improve your prayer life. I firmly believe that all cars should come equipped with a brake on the passenger side of the car as well. You know, if we're honest, it's not just teenagers who can be scary drivers. I didn't say anything. Have you ever ridden with another adult who really had no business driving in heavy traffic? You feel very out of control if you're the passenger in their car. I looked on Google for some images of scared passengers with bad drivers. I think you can relate to how this person feels. Look at that. My goodness. And then as I looked at the pictures, I realized the scared feeling can start at a very young age. Look at the look on this little guy's face. You know, wouldn't it be fun to come up with a caption for that picture? You know, I'm going to die. I'm going to die. And then I started wondering, when is a person really qualified to drive a car? And I ran across this, this picture. Don't worry, I'm qualified to drive. So, Brian, I need you to share that with my daughter because she hates puns. All right, there is a basic principle that says whoever is driving is the one in control. It's a big moment in your life when you hand someone else the keys. Up until now, I've been driving. I choose the destination. I choose the best route to get there. I choose the speed. You're in the passenger seat. But if we change seats, then you become the driver, and I have to trust you. It's all about control. Whoever is in the driver's seat is the person in control. You know, my car did not come equipped with a brake on the passenger side of the car, but it did come equipped with a backseat driver. Because no matter what route I take to my destination, this voice pops up and says, why are you going that way? It would be much quicker if you went this other way. When this happens, I simply say, this is my car, these are my keys, this is my way, and I'm in the driver's seat. I bring this up because this is Palm Sunday, and this is the day Jesus came riding into Jerusalem. So I want us to look at this scripture found in Matthew 21. It says, as Jesus and the disciples approached Jerusalem, they came to the town of Bethphage on the Mount of Olives. Jesus sent two of them on ahead. Go into the village over there, he said. As soon as you enter it, you will see a donkey tied there with its colt beside it. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone asks what you are doing, just say the Lord needs them, and he will immediately let you take them. This took place to fulfill the prophecy that said, Tell the people of Jerusalem, Look, your king is coming to you. He is humble, riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. The two disciples did as Jesus commanded. They brought the donkey and the colt to him and threw their garments over the colt, and he sat on it. 
Most of the crowd spread their garments on the road ahead of him, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Jesus was in the center of the procession, and the people all around him were shouting, Praise God for the Son of David. Blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Praise God in highest heaven. The entire city of Jerusalem was in an uproar as he entered. Who is this, they asked. So I think this scripture catches our eye because Jesus had an unusual form of transportation. He came to town riding on a donkey. That wasn't a real impressive way to enter the town. It was kind of like coming to town in a Ford Pinto. Everybody was cheering for Jesus, but they all had an agenda for him. They wanted to control him instead of surrendering control to him. Their agenda said things like, Jesus, come and take care of me. Come and heal me. Come and deliver me. Come on in and overthrow the Romans. Come on in and take back the temple. Come on in and get rid of those foreigners. Come on in and rearrange the circumstances of my life the way I want them to be. You know, they are willing to cheer for Jesus if Jesus is willing to do what they want him to do. Jesus, we're glad to have you in the car, but just remember, it's our car and these are our keys. I'm going to live my life my way, but you're welcome to be in the car with me. A lot of people are glad to have Jesus in the car as long as he's willing to sit in the passenger seat. Because something might come up in life where we need his help. Jesus, I just found out I have a health problem, so I'm going to need your help. Jesus, I have this major problem at my workplace. I could really use your help in trying to fix the problem. Jesus, I'm starting to feel some major anxiety over this situation in my life. I really need you to come and give me some peace of mind. I've been feeling kind of down the last few days. I could really use some of your hope. It seems that we're willing to have Jesus in the car with us, but we really don't want him to be the driver because whoever's driving is the one in control. If Jesus becomes a driver, then I'm not in charge of my life anymore. If Jesus becomes a driver, then I'm not in charge of my wallet anymore. If I give Jesus control of my wallet, then I don't get to just give money every now and then on those days that I feel generous. Now it's his wallet. And that can be kind of scary to give up control like that. If Jesus is driving, then I'm not in charge of my ego anymore. I no longer have the right to satisfy every self-centered ambition because it's his life now. Have you ever thought about giving up control of your mouth to Jesus? It's no longer your mouth where you can gossip, tear down, and yell angry words at people. Now Jesus controls your heart, and words are an overflow of the heart. So he now controls your mouth. It's a major decision when you get out of the driver's seat and hand the keys over to him. You're still actively engaged in every decision, but it's not your life anymore. It becomes his life. You know, the biggest question you need to answer today is this question, who's driving your life? It's the biggest question we all have to answer. Who's driving your life? Have you surrendered your life to Jesus? Have you given total control over to Jesus? Or is Jesus just riding in the passenger seat of your car? You know, when you read through the Bible, Jesus calls people to follow him with a total surrender of their lives to him. And Jesus makes it very clear, there is no way for a human being to come to God that does not involve surrendering control to God. When a good teacher has an important point that he really wants to drive home to his audience, he's going to make that point, but he's going to do it in a variety of different ways. This is what we see Jesus doing in the Gospels. Matthew 10, if you cling to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for me, you will find it. John 12, very truly I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Matthew 16, then Jesus said to his disciples, if any of you wants to come be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross and follow me. Life works better when Jesus is driving. You receive power through surrender that you cannot obtain any other way. 
You know, I could get so many people to come up here and testify, this is what my life looked like before I surrendered control to Jesus, and this is what my life looks like after I surrendered control to Jesus. My life is so much better now. I now have the power to forgive that I never had before. You know, many of you are familiar with the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. The 12 steps lay out a way of life that has led to freedom for addicts and for other people who were enslaved by some bad habit or some bad desire. If you think about the 12 steps of AA, in which of the 12 steps does it say, now try really hard not to drink? Which of the 12 steps does, does it say that? None of them. None of them say, now decide that you're not going to drink anymore. This powerful tool against this powerful addiction never asks people to decide to stop doing what they have to stop doing. They do not try to mobilize their will. They've tried that before, and they've failed. The key to victory is to surrender your will. In step one, we realize that we were powerless. Our lives were unmanageable. When I'm driving, I'm going to mess things up. In step two, we come to believe that a power greater than ourselves can restore us. That power has a name, and his name is Jesus Christ. We celebrate that resurrection power one week from today as we see his power over death. And then there's step three, which is what we've been looking at today. This is the most challenging step for many people. In step three, we make a decision to turn our will and our life over to the care of God. When you try to overcome your problem or your addiction by your own will or just by trying harder, then you will be defeated. It's when you choose to surrender your will that another kind of life becomes possible. You know, we think of surrender as some form of defeat, but it turns out that surrender is actually the path to victory and freedom. This doesn't just apply to an addiction like alcohol. It applies to other bad habits and brokenness and sin in general. The Bible says that all of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So can you see how these three steps apply to your life and your problem with sin? In step one, I admit that I have a problem with sin. I am powerless to fix this problem. I cannot save myself. In step two, I believe that a power greater than myself can restore me. God raised Jesus Christ from the dead, and he certainly can restore my life and fix my problem with sin. And in step three, I turn my life and my will over to the care of God. In this step, I give up control. Jesus moves to the driver's seat, and I move to the passenger seat. So how does that show itself in everyday life when you deal with a practical problem, let's say like anger? Have you ever been really, really mad at someone? Have you ever had an anger problem that just dominates your daily thought life? Maybe you had a coworker who treated you badly. Maybe you had a family relative who said something very hurtful about you. When you've been hurt badly by someone, your mind seems to just obsess over it. And before you know it, you're having all sorts of bad thoughts of things you'd like to do to repay them. You find yourself thinking, they're clearly a bad person, I'm clearly a good person, and here's a list of bad things I'd like to do to them. If you're serious about surrendering your life to God, then you surrender this anger issue as well, and you take your thought life to God. God makes it clear that there are certain things I should not do. Number one, thou shalt not murder. Okay, I won't kill the person. Number two, no violence. Okay, I won't hire somebody to beat them up. Number three, no gossip. At this point, you have a conversation with the Lord. Okay, Lord, if I agree to no murder and no violence, can't we leave gossip on the table? I would love to tell people about all the bad things he has done to me. When we truly surrender, then we are willing to say, okay, Lord, I will handle this situation in a way that honors you. When it's a difficult situation, like being angry with someone, then that surrender needs to happen on a daily basis. Every time those angry thoughts return, we go back to the Lord and we renew our commitment to surrender to him over and over again. 
You know, I could show you many more scriptures where the Bible stresses the need for us to give total control over to God. But sometimes I think we can be motivated to do this when we see it lived out in real life. I want you to listen to this true story. Pastor Steve Yeshik from Illinois lost his sister Judy after a five-year battle with cancer. She was a woman who, as Steve described her, was a party animal. She was a big drinker with a self-centered lifestyle. She was someone everybody loved because she was fun to be around. She was the life of the party. When Steve tried to share Jesus with her over the years, she would laugh it off and just keep partying. But at the age of 44, her world caved in. She found out that she had breast cancer, and she later learned that her husband had cancer as well. And then to make things even worse, she discovered that her husband was having an affair. And he announced that he didn't love her anymore, and he left her. It was during that time that she began to ask eternal questions. And soon she turned control of her life over to Jesus. From that time until her death, Jesus and his purpose became her top priority. With the same gusto she lived life as an unbeliever, she now approached her new life in Christ. Her greatest aim was winning others to Christ. She boldly shared her faith even as she was undergoing surgery after surgery, praying for a miraculous healing from the Lord. Judy ultimately came to see that the greater miracle would be for her friends and family to come to know Jesus as Lord and Savior. So even as she struggled for every breath, she talked her way out of the hospital about 10 days before her death so that she could be baptized and publicly proclaim that Jesus was the only way of salvation. Judy invited everyone she knew to come to her baptism service. And under the Holy Spirit's leading, she powerfully and urgently shared her testimony. Her 84-year-old father came to faith in Christ that night and was baptized, along with her ex-husband, a number of nieces, her aunt, her sister, and others. She even had a college roommate who was mixed up in a cult, and that lady gave her life to Jesus as well. Ten days later, Judy died, and even at her funeral, more people came to know Jesus as Lord and Savior. When Pastor Steve read the message that Judy had prepared for her own funeral service, another 100 people prayed to receive Jesus as Lord that day. So I don't know about you, but when I read that lady's story, I see the power of a surrendered life to Jesus Christ. When you give total control of your life over to God, His power is unleashed to do some amazing things in your life and in the lives of others. So I want to end this message by listing the three options that we have, and then we have to make a choice. Option one, I can live with a rebellious heart. If I choose this option, it means that I don't even want Jesus in the car with me. This is my life, and I'll live it any way I choose to live it. I don't need Jesus, and I don't need the church. Many people in our world have chosen this option, but the good news is that people can change. Some person or some situation comes into their lives, and they end up having a major life change. That happened in the story we just heard. So never, never stop praying for people. Option two, I can live with a divided heart. If I choose this option, then I'm in the driver's seat and Jesus is the passenger. I'm still very much in control, and I'm going to call on Jesus every now and then when I need help. If you live with a divided heart, then you might be living a life where you've surrendered certain parts of your life to Jesus, but you know you still have other parts that you've never given to him. Maybe you still haven't surrendered control of your wallet, or maybe there's an area of addiction that you just never have given to Jesus. You know, Jesus doesn't want followers who have divided hearts. Option three is the best option. I can live with a totally surrendered heart. 
And if I choose this option, then I move out of the driver's seat and Jesus becomes the driver and I become the passenger. Giving total control to Jesus can feel kind of scary at first, but you soon realize that it's the path to victory. There may be one major area of your life where you've struggled to give that area over to God. It might be anger, it might be an addiction, you know what it is. You've tried hard to fix this problem, but you've always failed. Just remember this, Jesus understands all about your struggle because he faced a struggle on this earth as well. Jesus knelt down in a garden. The reason we have Easter next week comes down to this one man. Jesus knelt down in a garden and he said, God, I don't want this. I don't want the cross. I don't want the weight. I don't want the burden. I don't want the shame. I don't want the pain. I don't want the suffering. I don't want the death. I don't want it. But not my will, yours be done. Father, you drive and I'll pay the cost. You and I have hope today because of what Jesus Christ did. So as we end this message, we invite you to give total control of your life over to Jesus. It's the best way to live. If you're holding back some area, now's the time to give it back, to give it all to Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for what Jesus did in the garden that day. Lord, because of what he did, we have hope today. Our sins can be forgiven. We have the hope of eternal life, all because of Jesus Christ. Lord, if there's anybody here today who needs to take that step forward and say, I'm tired of trying to run things, I'm ready to move over and allow you to be the driver, I pray they'll have the courage to do that. Lord, help us just to step forward to renew our commitment to surrender our lives to you, to give you total control. And that just unleashes your power to do some amazing things. So, Lord, may you receive all the glory and honor as people see your power at work in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.